Marcet Mall once said, Spain, that is the country where you'll find the strangest stories. He was right. Our lives are often changed by accidental encounters, a random moments forever trapped in amber. When I left Minnesota in the summer of 1969, I was flirting with failure at college and felt the threat of the draft and Vietnam War closing in on me, and I thought Europe might be my refuge. And it was on the island of Ibiza where I first met Elmir de Hori. He was sophisticated, charismatic, and I quickly fell under his spell and into his Lewis Carroll-like world of illusion and pretense. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but international press reports had dubbed him the world's greatest art forger. A criminal, a, a talented scoundrel, or iconoclast hero, depending on your point of view. But this was the 60s. This was a time when rebels were heroes and we challenged everything. He offered me a job as his personal assistant. I have no idea that he'd become my closest friend and mentor, or that it would lead me here to a courtroom in Spain where judges would decide Elmir's fate. The hearing happened on the morning of December 7th, and all morning FDR's famous words kept ringing through my head a day that will live in infamy. Save your servants for Sunday morning. The judges before you are qualified to impartially evaluate this case. Is that understood? Yes, yes sir. sir. Good. Then you may continue. Senor Pereira. Thank you, God. As I was saying, the charges against my client on which this hearing is predicated are groundless, based on accusations of a known criminal convicted of possessing counterfeit custom stamps and incarcerated in a hospital. Furthermore, Interpol had issued international arrest warrants against him for crimes committed in the United States, France, Switzerland, and Brazil. You're red again, Counselor. The instigator of these proceedings <laughs> is simply attempting to manipulate and pervert the integrity By of the By instigator, do you mean the French Ministry of Justice? If the French government had any legitimate claim against my client, they would have made it nine years ago. No, this travesty was concocted by Senor de Jorge's former associates for the purposes of publicly humiliating him. Please, do not permit bureaucratic procedure to take precedence over justice. Thank you, Senor Pereira. Senora Delgado, do you have any final yes, thoughts? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I would like to reiterate for the court one more time. Senor de Horan's guilt or innocence is outside the scope of these proceedings. We need only determine whether the extradition demand conforms with the extradition treaty between France and Spain. That is our sole purpose. And we are compelled as signatories to comply with this official request from the French government. Europe. Yes, you have made that abundantly clear. Thank you, everyone. I think we've heard enough testimony. We will make our final ruling within the week and contact you once we do. We're adjourned. Well, there you have it. Elmir's fate now rests on the words of the treaty. He's also aware of his ex-partner's role in this drama and the persistence of trade in which they both profited during their tortured alliance. It was in 1958 when Elmir first met this man who would change the course of his life. He was living in New York City, and his high society friends would flock to this urban charmer and collector of fine art, of which there seemed to be an endless supply. Do you remember that interesting exhibition we saw yesterday of abstract expressionists? I love their honest simplicity. There was one particular painting that was fantastic. It was an enormous canvas with a large red ball on a black background. It moved me. The cabinets of virtuosity were always incredible. Can you imagine? it is to draw a huge circle freehand. <laughs> what I'm drawing was the obvious symbolism of the piece. Clearly, the big red ball represented society on a black background on a square canvas 
which represented the conflict between the ideal and our struggle with harsh reality. <laughs> which reminds me, they're raising our rent for Waldorf again, as if we don't pay enough already. Oh, 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 oh. Breakfast at Tiffany. Yes, that's the one. Well, I wasn't impressed. His protagonist is nothing more than a petty slut. <laughs> I had heard it was well reviewed. If you ask me, Truman Capote will never amount to much as a writer. Well, we'll see. His epitaph may be more generous, especially if he writes Enjoying yourselves is plentiful for everyone, and you must try the sandwich that take. It's absolutely delicious. Ooh, thank you, I'm here. We will. I started out buying what I liked, mostly paintings of horses, cowboys with spurs. Well, then I found this picture of a big Indian squaw bathing in a river. Well, that's when my interest in art really took off. I gotta tell you, out to Range Meadows, Mr. Dolores. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. A genuine pleasure. I'm afraid of the Hawthorns. How do you do? You know, my cousin in Paris knows a whole lot more about modern art than I do. He got quite excited when I told him about you and your collection. You got a cousin living in Paris? Oh, the city of light. <laughs> well, I reckon. Well, he's been there his whole life as a hog farm with a few thousand head. <clears throat> hog farm in Paris? Yup, and he knows everybody in Paris. And he can't possibly know everyone. And the French may love hawk, but I get to see pigs strolling under the Eiffel Tower. Well, who's talking about France? I'm in Paris, Texas. <laughs> anyway, he says this Mo Digliana fella is famous, but I just don't understand why he didn't paint the eyes in this poor woman. If the eyes are supposed to be the windows of the soul, he's got them shutters closed. <laughs> Excuse me just for one moment. Go right ahead. Who is that, and why did you bring him here? Good God, Paul, go his stings. The only thing that you smell that bad is good cheese. I didn't know what to do. He's just off the boat from Egypt, a relative of an acquaintance who asked me to help him out. And frankly, I don't know how to get rid of him. But he's friendly, and he just needs a place to stay. You know it wouldn't be possible to put him up in my place. I, I thought perhaps he could sleep on your sofa. Are you out of your mind? He obviously has not bathed since he left Egypt, and his suit doubles as his pajamas. Oh, please, Corby, get him out of here before my guests all flee. You'll start a stampede. I know what it is to need help. Here, I'll take this. It's enough for a room at the YMCA for a week, but he can't stay here. A few months after he met Fernand Le Gros, Elmir took an overdose of sleeping pills, but was rescued before it was too late. He was tired of living his life on the run, evading detection, not to mention the spirit-crushing hopelessness of every failed attempt to sell his own work. After his suicide attempt, Elmir caught pneumonia, lost 30 pounds, and was in terrible shape. His friends rallied around him, but it was Dr. Korkos who remained as Elmir's primary caregiver. That is, until Korkos saw Fernand Legros' unexpected return, presented a unique opportunity. Korkos, what's taking so long? Listen, Elmir, I've been thinking. The weather in Florida would be much better for your health. You could use my apartment while you're there. You could even borrow my Cadillac and drive down. Drive? I don't have the strength for that. I can barely dress myself. Besides, you can't afford to be gone from your clinic for that long. <laughs> Me? Oh, no, I'm not going. But I know someone who could help. You remember that young man I brought to your apartment? Murray Hill, uh, Fernando Gro? You mean that smelly, badly dressed disaster? He will bathe regularly, I promise. He just needs a break. The two of you, he could let him stay on the sofa for a couple of days, and then he could drive you down to Florida. The two of you could stay there until you're well enough to drive yourself back. Really, he's not that bad. He's intelligent, and he's willing to do anything you want, or anything at all. He just needs a break. The two of you could help each other out until you don't need him any longer. Besides, it's nice. Nice? What does that mean? You wouldn't pee on my dining room table? <laughs> Where's he staying? Hello, Elmir! Oh, how nice to see you again! Oh. I brought you a gift. <laughs> Property of the Iona Shipping Line. Where? I'd like to thank 
you and the crew for your generosity. <laughs> Elmir could not foresee the consequences of this encounter, but later we would feel the impact of Fernand McGraw upon our lives. On our flight home to Ibiza, my thoughts drifted back to the hearing. Elmir's escape seemed so narrow, you could have sucked the tomes of Spanish law through a straw, and yet I remained confident that the Rose Crusade to exact revenge on Elmir would come to nothing. Senor Pereira was very persuasive in defusing the allegations against you and exposing them as a complete sham. Still, I can't believe that they were more concerned with the paperwork being in order than the absurdity of the extradition demand. It's as if justice has no place in a courtroom. I've always appreciated your optimism, and I hope you never change. But I'm afraid justice is just an illusion. And expectations of fairness, well, as they say, expectations are just premeditated disappointments. <laughs> if I didn't know Fernando grow as well as I do, I wouldn't feel so pessimistic. Remember, he tried this boy twice before and didn't succeed. Setbacks never deter zealots intent on destroying their enemies. And this hearing was orchestrated by a man bent on destroying me. Oh, what was my crime? What did I do to deserve this? The problem was getting mixed up with Bernard McGraw in the first place. Oh, don't you think I know that? I knew he was someone I would never invite to my dinner table when I first met him, but later, I needed him. Aren't all relationships based on me? If I hadn't needed you when we first met, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. You know, Elmir, when you first took a chance on me, seven years ago when you offered me that job, I needed you too. Remember the first day I came in and I helped you move your artwork and furniture around and I came across the magazine article, the one that said, the world's greatest art forger? Well, that took some explaining, but we worked it out. I know you didn't choose this as a career path. You were a refugee, you were trying to survive. Oh, my whole bloody life has been a struggle. Never mind my being famously infamous for my art. My life has always been at risk because of who I was. My parents knew before I did that I was different. I, I don't think they could ever accept me for who I really was. No, I don't think so. That may be so, but I know the real Elmir, and you are kind and generous, and that's why you helped Fernand grow. You helped him save him from a life as a dancer in sleazy cabarets. Still, he was always able to seduce me with his lies and promises even when I knew better. Oh, I, I must be the world's stupidest person. I never should have told him my little secret on that drive to Miami. It was the worst decision I ever made. Well, you've been here for two weeks. I think I'm feeling well enough to make it on my own. What do you mean? I mean, I no longer need your help. Besides, I can't afford to continue supporting you. I've been paying for everything, and I'm almost broke. Well, well, what are we going to do? There is no we. You can go out and find a job and pay for your own room. Elmir, why don't you do some small Picasso drawings for me to sell? We could live for a couple months off of just one. Oh, I was crazy to ever confide in you. I was stupid. I was delirious. What was I thinking? No. No one would ever believe you are the owner of a finger painting, let alone a Picasso. <laughs> Absolutely not. You don't know the first thing about art. It would never work. Please, Elmir, you, you have this incredible talent. But we don't need to starve. Besides, you said you never really liked to sell because it always made you so nervous. Well, listen, my friend. I know these people. I know their game. It's just business. I grew up in the soup in Cairo. I know these people. That's my talent. Just tell me what to say. I promise this will work. I won't disappoint you. <laughs> You'll see. All right, all right, you made your point. You can stop controlling. Now, I'm going to come up with a story, and you're going to say exactly what I tell you. You don't change anything, you understand? Now, when the diva asks where you acquired this, 
drawing, say you uh, inherited them from your great auntie. Oh, you got someone to get them. No! <laughs> you don't know where she got them, but they've been in your family for years. Now, you're going to have two Picassos, which I will do right now. Do you think you can remember your story? Yes. Good. Just one more thing. You'll never be a gentleman, but you can't smell like a bum. Take your bag. Hey, put on clean socks. You wear one of my jackets and top. They agreed that the pro would receive 25% of any sale made that day. Then, Elmir waited. And despite his considerable reservations, something remarkable happened. God bless America! Oh, Elmir! It worked! <laughs> I cannot believe how easy it was. Oh, I did exactly as you told me, and you should have seen the grief in his eyes. Oh, I knew I should have asked for more than you wanted. No, he knew he was getting something he could sell tomorrow at a sizable marker, and I was almost broke. How much did you get? <laughs> now that you've seen I can do this, don't you agree that I deserve more than I did? 25% commission you promised me? I think 35% is more fair, don't you? Mon cher. Elmir, you should do some paintings. Uh, those would fetch more. You could do one of your, your Molianis and, and a Matisse. Think about how much we could get for those. There are chickens waiting to be plucked, my friend. And I plan to be the mother of all pluckers. The Groves' first two sales of the Picasso drawings in Miami did start something big, and neither of them knew where it would be. From city to city, they replicated Henry Ford's assembly line, churning out saleable masterpieces. By the time they reached Los Angeles, Elmir was certain of one thing. His young partner was intent on getting rich. Even though the Groves was successful in selling all of Elmir's fakes, Elmir suspected he wasn't getting his full share of the money, so he would occasionally venture out on his own. Anymore? 
Tell me, Elmir, where did you get the extra money? Let me guess! You sold Cezanne. Yes, all right, I sold it. But I didn't get much for it. You promised me that you would let me do the selling. Besides, you never asked for enough. These dealers, they're just, they're just dishonest. And she, I know these mangy dogs. Remember, I grew up in Egypt. I've seen every trick these merchants used to screw you. How much did he pay you? Well, I, uh... How much did he pay you? Four hundred dollars. Elmir, Elmir, Elmir. Well, that's why he needs me. That's why you need me. Elmir, I must be twice that. I am the only one who has the best interest at heart. Me. And gentlemen's agreements. I expected more integrity from your friends. Don't steal from friends. The treachery of deceit. Oh, man, that's what we read. Why well, you stole money from me? You stole money from me. Please, please, <laughs> Elmir. Please promise me you'll you'll let me do the selling from now on. Yes, fine. Whatever you say. What are you staring at? Show's over. Oh, piss off! <laughs> Good. That's settled. <clears throat> now, you owe me four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars for what? But I told you I could have gotten at least eight hundred from the Cezanne. My cut would have been half. But we agreed you would get thirty-five percent of the sale. That's it. and needed to regain my trust. Besides, a 50-50 partnership is only fair. We've had success everywhere we've been, thanks to me. All right, all right, 50-50. Good. So from now on, there is total honesty between us. No secrets. You're all right. Honesty is the best policy. Here, what's this? A fake passport. You are now officially Canada's newest citizen. Where did you get this? Oh, my contact in Montreal. There was a small problem. It was slightly more expensive than we thought. How much? Just fifteen hundred. What? Elmir, think of it as an investment. You will slide past customs like the king of Sheba. So, my friend, where do you want to go? Paris. I want to go back to Paris. <laughs> Yes, you're brilliant! I love Paris in the springtime. We'll return like, like Napoleon and whoever was second in charge. <laughs> but first, Elmira, we should visit those vultures over on 57th Street and lighten their wallets. God, I love New York. It is full of suckers. Elmira, it's time we pass the collection plate. It had been three days since the hearing in Mallorca, and still no word from Elmir's lawyers. I struggled to comfort him. Here, this is for you. Why? It's the catalog to the opening of my gallery. Where on earth did you find it? I kept it and just had it framed. Do you remember that day? Oh, yes. Of course. It seems like a long time ago now. Uh, no, not so long. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I think about it often. What I remember the most about that day is how proud I was of you. Oh, well, I didn't think you were going to make me the director of the gallery. I just thought I would help you out. And no one has ever shown me that degree of confidence and support before. I never want to let you down. And you never have. Senor Pereira, have the judges made a ruling yet? I'm afraid not. I'm here to see Senor de Jorge on another matter. Ah, Cesar, please come in. Hello, Elmir. How are you both holding up? Oh, we're fine. And you? We are hopeful, of course, that the judges will reject this insane demand and rule in your favor, as they have before. Well, I want to thank you for everything that you've done. Oh, do you have everything ready? Yes, of course. Good, let's start. Tell me, where do I start? Elmir, what's going on here? Oh, didn't I tell you? I'm making you my heir. It was good to see you, Elmir. 
I'll call you Saturday morning. I should have some news by then. Well, whatever the outcome, I thank you for everything, Cesar. Yes. Mom, would you come here for a moment? I was going through my papers and I came across this. I don't think you've seen it before. What's this? Oh, just a letter. A uh, former boyfriend of Fernand sent it to me a while ago. He provides some insight into Glaubreau's true nature. Go ahead, <coughs> read it. My dear Elmir, you might be interested to know how that son of a bitch, Fernand Glaubreau, started his gallery in Paris. It all began with a large trunk you left on consignment at the Winslow Hotel in New York. Legro told me that after he sold you a passport and you returned to Europe, he wasted no time. Hello, yes, this is Mr. DeVore, and I left a trunk with you on consignment. It's still there, isn't it? Good. Uh, I'm having a friend collect it for me, Mr. Fernand Legro. Well, what does he look like? Well, a distinguished man, oh. handsome. He'll have a letter from me in identification. When he arrives, I'd like you to give him the trunk. Thank you. Jumping on the next flight to New York City, Fernand went immediately to the Winslow Hotel, where he presented the hotel director with a forged letter instructing him to retrieve the trunk belonging to Mr. Elmir Dahori and deliver it to the room of Mr. Fernand the Grove. But he didn't have a key for the lock. I don't understand. Fernand is not the kind of person What he wanted. I'm sure the letter was very convincing because the hotel director gave him the trunk. Yes, yes, room service. I, I'd like some tea, a croissant, and a very large sharp knife. Because I'm blind and your miserable croissants are as hard as wood. So long. Not 
Paris, Texas, Paris, France. Uh, I've just acquired a superb memoir that I just know your love. And let me tell you, at $80,000, it is a steal. Uh, yes, yes, of course I'll send photos. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> when Almir returned to Paris, he had no intention of reuniting with Legros and knew nothing of the source of Legros' thriving business, nor did he think that their paths would cross again. <laughs> Amir! Oh, mon cher! I was so worried something bad happened to you when you never showed up to our rendezvous. I was afraid you had fallen into the hands of the gendarme. Thank God you're safe and... Oh, look well. Well, I appreciate your concern. You appear to prosper. Well, may I join you? Only ah. for pay. <laughs> Amir! Where are you living now? Ah, uh, Madrid. Ah, but you're in Paris. Are you still painting? Oh, no, I haven't painted a thing since I left the States. <laughs> Elmir, you are such a liar. <laughs> That's true, mon cher. I am doing well, and I owe it all to you. I I'm selling real art now, but I don't think any of it's as good as yours. Elmir, you could have been a part of my success. You know, I never had the knowledge that you have. I, I know that, but what I understand it's human nature. My clients, they feel privileged to buy art from me. And when you were selling art, they could smell your desperation and the sleazy bastards would take advantage of you every time. <laughs> Work with me again, Elvira. I will write you a check for a thousand dollars right now. Consider it an advance on future sales. You can just do what you do best, and I'll do what I do best. <clears throat> I have a client coming tomorrow, and I just know that if I had a small Renoir or Modigliani, he would just buy it immediately. But let me take you out for a nice lobster dinner, and we can discuss the details. You can almost hear the snake charmer's flute luring him near back into the fold, and he couldn't resist Legros's powers of persuasion. Soon, Elmir began fabricating pieces once more, this time tailored to Legros's wishes. Over time, Legros made a fortune. Elmir, he made less. Over the next six years, Legros sold Elmir's face on five continents. Then everything began to unravel one evening in Dallas. Elmir's old clients, Alvin Meadows, had endowed a Texas university with Spanish master's paintings, which he later learned were mostly fakes. Then he decided to collect French modern masters, and Legros convinced him that he was the best person to help him do that. Meadows wanted to show off his art, so he invited a number of experts to assess the collection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. It's my pleasure to have so many experts on modern art together at one time. I've been collecting works by some of the world's greatest artists, and it is my honor to unveil the entire collection for the first time. We're proud of you. Mr. Meadows, I know you asked for our opinions on your collection. Would you like those in writing or an oral assessment now? Please, I'd like to know what you think now. Absolutely. You really be candid and honest in our jugement. I wouldn't have it any other way. A real beauty ain't shaped. When I look at this mode of the army portrait, it just doesn't seem right. I don't think he would have drawn a line like that. Yes, sir. Ernie's a picture of what did you say? I agree. And mon Dieu, this Matisse, it's the colors. Well, what about the colors? They are not what I associate with Matisse. I think it's wrong. Wrong? What do you mean it's wrong? I've been an agent for Picasso for over 20 years, and while this genius work might fool anyone unfamiliar with Picasso's work, I think it's an out and out fake. Oh no, not again. Perhaps my colleagues are of different opinions. <laughs> but from looking around, I think the entire collection is doubtful. <laughs> and I'm being jealous. 
Where did you get all of this? Well, from someone who's about to make the acquaintance of the Dallas Chief of Police. Do 
It's all right, my dear. He has no idea we're here in Geneva. Monsieur de Ori, please come with me. What's this about? I've done nothing. I have summoned you here to get to the bottom of this matter, which I owe to you, Monsieur Le Gros. <clears throat> According to your complaint, you have accused Monsieur de Henri of making death threats against you. Is that correct, sir? Well, it's the absolute truth. Why would I lie? Hmm. Uh, Monsieur Le Gros, these death threats, what makes you certain they came from Monsieur de Henri? I recognize his, his Austro Hungarian accent. Besides, he made repeated calls to my home. What exactly did he say? He said that if I didn't bring exactly $100,000 to the lobby of the Hotel de Rome at exactly 1 o'clock, he would have me killed. And when did he make these phone calls? Sometime between 1 and 5 in the morning. Between 1 and 5 is a very long time. Don't you ever look at your watch? <coughs> well. When I want to know the time, I just hold my arm out to my servants, read it to me. What else should one have servants for? Besides, my psychiatrist has me on sleeping pills. We have the phone records, and Monsieur de Hockey made no phone calls from his hotel room during those hours. We know all about your schemes, Monsieur, Monsieur Le Gros. We know about them and your association with criminals. <gasps> the police have been watching you for some time. Now, about those thugs you hired and the house you rented where you attempted to lure Monsieur de Orgy. Well, I only wanted him to stop harassing me. Mr. Lebrun, if you tell one more lie, it will be you who is going to jail. <laughs> that you are wasting this court's time. I've had enough of you. How did you ever secure your release from the sanatorium? Good behavior. Oh, get it now. Monsieur de Ori, we never believed his wild accusations and only took you into custody for your own protection. However, you should still be careful. You may leave through my chambers. Thank you. I've never had the law on my side before. <laughs> Good luck. You see, I told you. The law was crazier than we imagined and thought it best to return to Ibiza, Elmir Sanctuary. Do you have any more? 
possible. So possibly I have some things in storage on both sides. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I must run. Do call me if you come across any more small treasures. You can always reach me. I can eat. Thank you, my dear. You've made me a very happy woman. You have such a happiness they are. The very patriotic. Still celebrating the liberation of Paris. Vive <laughs> France! Vive France! <laughs> we should all sing the Marseillaise. <laughs> See you soon, I hope. Au revoir, ma chérie. Recognizing you for your true 
talents. Okay, so it's been a long time coming, but remember what Jesus said about casting the first stone. So screw them. Okay, well, you didn't say that last part. <laughs> I, mean, I agree with you. You know, Amir, when I couldn't find you this morning, I thought that <coughs> Did you get any sleep last night? I was dreaming of Paris after the war when I sold my first Picasso. You know, I never felt good about deceiving anyone. We just wanted to sell my own work. It's just that when I realized I could make something that I could create in 20 minutes that would guarantee my survival for the next few months, well, I'd like to see the poor refugee who could resist that temptation. It's a choice I made. But for most of my life, it looked as though it was the only option I had to survive. Maybe the faking was wrong. But what's the difference between my work and the others? What, the, the fashionable signature? You tell me what a Jackson Pollock would fetch without his signature attached. There's the acid test. Would they praise his work then? They have no choice. They have to accede to the extradition demand. It's okay, Mom. No. No. I have a feeling. Now, listen to me. I, I have a list of things I need for you to do. I, I've written letters to all my friends, and I want you to give them to everyone. No. No, now is not the time to surrender. You have survived the Nazis and the Russians in internment camps and in torture and being a refugee. The personal rejection. You survived these plots of Fernand Legros, too. I'm sorry for these responsibilities, but I know I can trust you to carry out my wishes. Now I have very little time. You're right. You're right. We do have very little time. You said that we have fake passports. Well, we can take them to Morocco. We can fight the extradition from another country. Sorry. You know the success of your exhibition in Madrid? That is the sort of success that you have been wanting your entire life to be accepted as an artist in your own right. God damn it, aren't you ready to fight for that? I could not bear the infamy of being hunted down by a pack of wild dogs. To be arrested, to be carried away and changed. Oh, but I can't, I won't. Oh, Mir, aren't you willing to fight for me? Mark, I never told you this. But one day when we weren't here, a stranger came to this house. He told me that Fernand Legro had put out a contract out on him. If I ever went to jail in France, I'd be killed. Don't you see, Mark? This is the real reason for the extradition he and his lawyers orchestrated. Fernand Legro wants to kill me. Why are you saying this? Why are you saying this? I'm saying I will not run. I will not give Fernand Legro I will not be murdered in a French prison. Remember what Nietzsche said? We can always exit when we want. Now I have to go. No. No, 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 please don't. No, I love you. Stay with me. Please don't come with me. Don't make this any harder than it already is.
always travel fast on the island. Familiar faces line the cemetery. Before the burial, I received an official request from the French government. They wanted to have the body fingerprinted to make sure it was Almir. After all, if anyone could fake his own death, it would be Almir, right? I, I couldn't bear witnessing this last indignation. No one close to me had died before Almir, so I guess my lessons in Amitha weren't over left yet. Learning what it is to lose someone you love must be the hardest thing to learn. The girl's apparent victory was short-lived. <laughs> he died seven years later from cancer in 1983. I returned to Minnesota, drank wine, I wore ascots, and I recounted stories few I think believed. For a long time, I would have been, I, I thought that Elmir would be hugely disappointed in me. But that is until years later, when I rediscovered my old diaries. I knew then the path I had to follow. So I took the easy way out. I became a writer. I dedicated my first book to him. It's about a remarkable man and an amazing adventure. And I'm thinking of turning it into a play. <laughs>